And with that, we are switching um, uh, format a little bit. So the next um, point on the agenda is the presentation of the Sensor CDT uh, Team Challenge. And for those of you who don't know, this is essentially a team project that the cohort of our first year master's program is taking on uh, as a group. And so they will present today on, on the progress of um, work they've done as part of the OXI project. And for those of you who haven't heard of that, that's an oxygen and ventilator systems initiative that we started in Cambridge last year. And um, uh, let's hear from the team. And we'll finish the presentation with releasing this, uh, the design open source. So there'll be actually um, some, some release at the end of this uh, talk. So thanks, everyone, for, for joining us today. And um, the stage is yours. Well, thanks, Axel, for the introduction. So, as he said, we're the 2020 cohort of the Sensor CDT, and we'll be presenting our summer project. So, first of all, we all know ventilators. They're medical devices that help people breathe, and they're the main response to acute cases of COVID. And when the shortage in medical device became an issue as part of the, the pandemic, many different initiatives tried to develop their own or develop and deploy new ventilators, so that's not a trivial exercise because ventilators are highly regulated equipment and obviously is one of such initiatives. So it's the Oxygen and Ventilator System Initiative. So it has a ventilator uh, side project and a oxygen concentrator project. And we took over the work of the previous design team to try and improve the ventilator side. So the ventilator was initially uh, designed to be able to alternate between different breathing modes. So helping patient breathe and breathing on behalf of the patients. And they're also designed to fit the supply chain challenges of LMICs by having different parts that can be either supplied or manufactured locally. So we are a team of, as you can see, a wide different uh, range of background. And we focused into the technical side of things and then inclusive innovation. So to try and fit the challenges of low and middle income countries and then documentation. So we're all going to present our results by first reviewing the medical device supply challenges and then introducing our work on documentation, technical development, and then the roadmap for OPSI's future development. So when you look at the ventilator market generally, the projections show that from 2017 to 2019, the ventilator market was steadily rising. And then you can see there was a huge spike in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic, which was expected to kind of come back down to a general trend line moving forward projected to 2025. But the question is, where is this, like, what's the actual distribution of this ventilator market? So here you can see that 83% of the ventilator market revenue is actually in high, coming from high income countries rather than low income countries. And this is a vast kind of difference from the actual distribution of the world population and thus the need for ventilation. So there's 16% in high income countries and 84% of the world's population live in low and middle income countries. So as part of our literature review, we looked at the actual ventilator accessibility in low and middle income countries and we pulled 27 LMICs kind of est means of estimated data. And we found that 1.78 million people per ventilator per country uh, in LMICs pre-COVID. This situation was sort of helped with donations and also government procurement due, due to COVID. And it kind of went down to roughly 1.04 million people per ventilator per country. But when we compare this to the situation in, in the pooled situation in 11 high income countries, where there's only 3,377 people per ventilator, the difference is kind of vast and clear. And it's not just the actual accessibility to ventilators, it's also how those ventilators are functioning and, and the kind of support that comes with them. So we learned from our, our conversations with clinicians around the world that, um, that we learned about the damaging effects of erratic power supplies, uh, oxygen supplies not being kind of completely, completely consistent and also a lack of after-sales support and um, 
and actual training to use the devices. So there were stories of having 10 medical devices, 10 ventilators still wrapped in their boxes whilst people are still dying, which is horrible. And so the real problem is not just, well, there is a problem with actual number of ventilators, but the real problem is actually the access to ventilation as well. So when you have a ventilator, you also need resources for maintenance and repair, you need access to spare parts, you need trained technicians to, to replace those parts, and you also need trained medical staff to, to use the ventilator, combined with operating resources such as oxygen and consumables that are sterile, and you also need your device to be built for the operating environment. And because these devices are actually, most of them are designed with the West in mind, as was discussed earlier, they are not designed with those things in mind. So there comes a point where adding more ventilators and donating more ventilators does not actually produce kind of a proper benefit to, to the places where it's needed. So with that knowledge, we, with that knowledge that we learned, we st spoke to the design team and advised and suggested for obviously that a combination of appropriate design, after sales support, and also training as part of the business model would be beneficial for for everyone involved. So looking at the alternatives for ventilators in low and middle income countries, the ideal ventilator would be in this top right, the ideal ventilator would be in this top right uh, quadrant, so low cost of ownership and the most context appropriate. Currently, what's mostly available are donations in the second hand market, which have a low cost of ownership, but, but they do not, they're not really context appropriate at all whereas commercial manufacturers have a higher cost of ownership and kind of range in, uh, they have, they range in their cost of ownership and they have, they do not have that much context appropriate design because they're designed for high income countries. So the kind of exciting up and coming things which is mainly kickstarted by the COVID-19 pandemic where the non-profit non initiatives, social enterprises and local startups which are actively trying to design context appropriate devices that will, that will be beneficial. And so looking at these, there's, there's a complete range of maturity in these designs. So you see Gradient Health Systems, they're kind of one of the top at the moment, doing really, really well. And obviously it's still in its very early R&D stage. So if we go to a SWOT analysis of OVSI, the strengths of OVSI are context appropriate design, communicate, good communication with stakeholders, and, and trying to facilitate low unit costs and easy, easy manufacturing and repairs. Weaknesses are just the development, is the pure development stage and the kind of how far it is from regulatory approval and it needs a lot of time, money and resources. The opportunities, there are great opportunities for funding and also collaboration and just to do beneficial things. The, the threats are a lot of these low cost ventilators coming into the market and also local procurement processes and through governments can end up in monopolies that could be hard to break into. But we shouldn't see these existing context appropriate designs as, as threats. They should be viewed as, part, viewed as partners because they all have the same goal. But if, given, given saying that, the actual, there is actually a lot of room for OVSI to kind of grow and flourish. As you can see, all of the countries marked in yellow have currently no known organizations serving context appropriate ventilators. So there's definitely space for OVSI to to find its place. So obviously at the moment, the actual ventilator is in TRL3, which is a lab proof of concept model. So it's got quite a way to go and I'll now hand over to the documentation team to kind of explain what needs to be done to get to that regulatory approval. So uh, open source was kind of uh, at the heart of the off approach. Uh, because they wanted to ensure that whatever was made could be helped, you know, potentially being built around the world in the areas that need it most. But they decided to do open upon release model wherein they only report uh, what they've done once everything was finished. And while that has its merits, um, it kind of meant during its rapid initial creation there was more focus on developing the invention rather than documenting what was being done each time. And so while it was able to produce quite a good you know, technological uh, ventilator, 
and we found that there was lots of information that missing that would be vital to kind of help this be reproducible. And this included kind of um, why they chose to make the design the way it is, uh, kind of where they got the electronics from, and kind of uh, whether the materials fit certain regulations. So in order to kind of help complete the uh, open source documentation, we first looked at reviewing best open source practices to help build a framework for not only the current work of, of OVSI, but also to set uh, a guideline for our team that when they helped improve the technical design, that this was going to be able to be reported in an open source way. Uh, we found that uh, as so many members uh, worked on OVSI, information was kind of fragmented between different people, so we had to work on gathering information of because that was a struggle in itself just to find it as many people knew different things as uh, yeah it was quite difficult at times just to get the information before we could actually uh, make it ready to be put online and so the final stages were then getting all the design files uh, writing readmes for the different materials that we could get our hands on so to help make it a little more open and reproducible by others. Um, also, as part of documentation, we also looked into kind of some of the medical regulations that would apply to the ventilator. As, you know, if, it, if obviously it's going to be successful, it's going to have to get regulatory approval. And this is something that hadn't quite had been looked at fully at the time. And so while we didn't have time to uh, fully make the ventilator regulatory appropriate. We identified some several key areas uh, which we thought we could improve within the time frame that we had. So things like the power system, the alarm pressure, and user interface all had certain aspects that uh, we thought could be improved, and this helped uh, inform the tech team in their work. So this is where we from the tech team stepped up. So um, we started by analyzing the current design of the system. Um, as you can see, so the air is coming through here, it's compressed, it goes through um, a couple of uh, pressure relief valves, and then it's mixed with the oxygen in the mixing tank. Then it goes through a couple of more safety valves until it reaches the inhale um, solenoid valve. So what this valve is doing is um, controlling the pressure and tidal volume that goes into the patient. So this is the inhale part and this is the exhale part. So it's very important to control the pressure here so that we uh, provide the right amount of um, assisted breathing. In terms of the um, control system, we divided the system in four main design units. Um, I'm going to start with the first and most fundamental uh, unit, which is the power system. Um, the power system is um, the most fundamental one because um, all of the other design units depend on its stability. Um, as the pressure sensors read data from these, um, um, from, uh, these locations, the data is sent to the CPU. And the CPU controls the so-called solenoid actuators, which control um, the state of the um, inhalation and exhalation throttle valves, meaning how, um, how open or how close they are and what is the pressure that's going into, flowing into the patient. Of course, this is controlled by the clinician via the user interface and the display, and all of the information goes through the CPU. After analyzing the um, current system, where this, you can see the CPU, the pressure sensors, the power, 
Um, we have identified some main system um, design limitations, especially with respect to medical regulations, as Matthew mentioned, um, which is why we've, we decided to redesign the whole system from the ground up. And each member was assigned a part, and we worked closely together to ensure all the design units come seamlessly um, together. So I'm going to start by introducing um, the power system. So this is, um, the, uh, this is how um, the power system um, looked like or looks like in the initial prototype. And this is how the uh, system looks from the first prototype after the redesign. And <laughs> before you become overwhelmed with uh, this picture, um, I'm going to walk you through the logic behind it. Um, so as it was pointed out this morning uh, by our inspirational speaker, Klaus, innovation is really not enough. So today I want to point out that um, this system is not only designed for um, high level um, technical applications, but also for low and middle income countries where the power sources are very often unstable and are often exposed to harsh environment. Um, so this is why the design is based on the so-called um, power multiplexer. We, what it does is basically, so we have a medically approved uh, AC to DC converter, which takes the power from the main and converts it to stable 12 volt DC, which go to the motor. However, in case of power failure, which is um, very, um, very possible, the system will switch automatically to the um, battery without having to switch off the ventilator, meaning that we are saving the patient in case um, he or she needed uh, heavy as assisted breathing. Um, in case the power is reapplied, um, the system will switch automatically back um, to the main power and the battery will start charging so that it is prepared for the next time when there is a power, power failure. Um, after that, um, the protection circuit, which you can see here, this is the protection circuit, uh, makes the system robust um, against any ripples uh, or instabilities. Um, then the 12 volts are further converted to, to 5 volts for the pressure sensors and 5 volts for the display, as well as 3.3 volts for the CPU. Uh, it's important to uh, mention that uh, most of the uh, components are medically approved, but the ones that are not are, um, in, are included in a feedback with an alarm system so that the clinician is informed if something happens. As you see here, these are absolutely the same thing, um, but here redundancy is um, incorporated so that if any of those components fail, um, the system can switch um, very similarly to this, to the second DC converter, and can continue to power up the whole system. Um, so um, the last thing I want to mention is that um, all the components are easily sourced and replaceable in case of a harsh environment which causes any damages to the system. But instead of me talking for another minute, um, I will try to... Um, give a short demonstration. Um, the LEDs showed the functionality of each DC converter, and this green LED shows the output of the system. So this system contains AC to DC converter, which uh, basically provides 12 volts to four voltage regulators. If I disconnect this DC to DC converter from the board, the board's uh, um, input is going to switch to the second DC to DC converter. And as you can see, the LED is still on, meaning we still get power. So now what I'm going to do is, and now instead, I'm going to disconnect the second one. And as you can see, the LED continues to be on, meaning that the system has switched sufficiently quickly to the second DC converter, and we could not even see a change in the LED. Yeah, 
Thank you very much. So another thing that the tech team had to deal with um, was the huge amount of alarms that have to be uh, included in the system to meet medical requirements. These can kind of broadly be split into two different types of alarms, so application, which are to do with the use of the device, and then technical, which is more to do with the hardware. So we decided to focus on the technical side, mainly because these alarms could be integrated into the new power management system that Stephanie was talking about a moment ago. So we designed two main circuits uh, to complete sort of the alarms we wanted. The first was a 555-based battery capacity circuit, and the idea of this one was that it would monitor the capacity of both the backup internal battery and also the alarm battery. So we use lithium-ion batteries, and this is kind of the classic discharge um, curve here. It kind of goes down gradually and then very rapidly towards the end. We used um, a 12-volt uh, battery, so we kind of wanted to monitor when it gets to about 10% uh, state of charge, which was corresponding to around 10 volts. So we then built a circuit, it looks super complicated, it's not, um, to monitor basically all it does is this little alarm turns on when the input of the battery drops to 10 volts. So then we also did a second type of circuit, um, and this type, it was a PE channel MOSFET type circuit. Um, and again, the idea of it is super simple. When the input um, drops to around 0.5 volts, so near zero, or zero, the alarm turns on. And this is basically so that um, any component that's attached to the circuit, if it's faulty or if the signal stops, uh, we get an alarm going on. So it's just for monitoring the state of the components. So we put all of these into the prototype. So this is the part Stephanie talked about. And then you can see we have three of the uh, disconnect circuits. So that's uh, for each of the DC to DC converters and also for the mains internal battery switching. And then we also, uh, we would need to include one just to check that the alarm battery is included. And then we, we've included one of the battery capacity circuits that monitors the state of the internal battery. And we just need to include one more to monitor the state of the alarm battery. So that is a quick overview of the alarms. Um, I'll pass on to Doogie, and he's going to talk about pressure management. Um. Right, so uh, with, um, as, as, as Stephanie kind of alluded to earlier, uh, the pressure system is basically comprised of a load of board, mount, board mounted pressure sensors that then have plastic tubing, which kind of plugs into the gas circuit. Uh, there are th in the existing design, there are three um, uh, pressure sensors, but uh, after a little bit of sort of uh, digging, they, they don't really capture very many uh, metrics, and the metrics they do capture, they don't capture particularly well. Uh, so we designed a new uh, pressure, system, pre pressure sensor placement. Um, this captures uh, uh, critical um, sort of parameters uh, uh, like the previous one uh, a lot better. So, for example, this flow meter now has uh, well mixed air uh, and uh, is actually measuring the actual sort of uh, flow of air that's being inhaled rather than just in the system. Um, some regulatory stuff uh, that, that wasn't in the previous system. So, for example, you need to know uh, the input pressure. Uh, of oxygen, and otherwise there are sort of you know sort of oversights as well, like uh, you know the placement of this this valve this uh, pressure sensor here after the uh, exhale valve lets us know that the valve has actually been actuated. Um, so uh, how is this how is this actually implemented? Uh, so we after a bit of thinking, we, we sort of stuck with a digital system, uh, basically for one very simple reason, in that it makes it very simple to build. Uh, and obviously, given the, the context of this system, um, it's, it's quite a key consideration. Uh, there, it allows us to do some other things, uh, like um, uh, measure the temperature, which is a medical requirement to some parts of the gas circuit, as well as um, uh, the actual sensors we use to have internal diagnostic bits at the, uh, at the uh, beginning of their ITC communication, which is, again, quite useful for sort of knowing what's going on in the system. Um, yeah, these, these are the actual sensors we use. You can see them down there. Um, these, in theory, should uh, have, a, have a range and accuracy that, that should be sort of suitable for sensing across the entirety of the system. Um, uh, uh, um, and uh, so, obviously, because we've got loads of the same sensor and you don't want to have to be contacting the manufacturer to get loads of different uh, ones with different ITC addresses, uh, we've got an ITC multiplexer, what this, uh, which effectively allows you to address each individual sensor. What this actually means, though, is that the system is very flexible. Um, in that it, you know, we, we can change over the pressure sensors for different ranges. 
or different types, depending on how the gas circuit sort of continues to evolve. Um, uh, so the work that needs to be done next is basically just uh, integrating. So we've got a sort of little working prototype, uh, but uh, now uh, integrate these sort of drivers that control all of that into the main sort of control log logic for the and uh, build the the control logic for the uh, for the ventilator, which I think Liam is going to talk about next. Thank you. So, yeah, as, as Diggy alluded to, um, for the most part of the, the project, I was mainly concentrated with the, the software that, that actually drives the, the ventilator itself. Um, to give you a bit of an overview of the, or a, qu a quick summary of the, I've, well, I've got current state there, previous state might have been the, uh, a better word, essentially the, the state of the system when we, when we first uh, encountered it. Um, the, the implementation of, of, of the ventilator on the software side has been um, done using a monolithic kind of Arduino project um, weren't running on a, an STM32 um, microcontroller. Um, as I say, it's a single kind of single file kind of monolithic code base, which is kind of suitable if you're kind of doing kind of early prototypes and you're kind of uh, and, and you're trying things out and you want to produce like a proof of concept. But as you move towards um, actual kind of implementation, actual kind of production, um, and and uh, going going for, going to, to towards completion, um, you really need a, a, to to really kind of think more deeply about kind of how you're designing your software, how you're making it kind of more robust and you're making it kind of extensible so it can be extended in the future. Um, and certainly given the motivation that we've spoken about earlier um, about kind of low cost, rapid, scalable production, the ability to be able to take components and sort of change them or, or, or modify them in some way to, uh, to reflect kind of pricing changes, um, global kind of availability and supply, um, that's something that's really important. And it can be difficult to achieve this if you have a if you have a kind of software solution that requires or that, that, that consists of quite tightly coupled code where all of your components are kind of interconnected and can, yeah, and, and the like. Um, essentially, changing a, a sensor or changing uh, your display type or something like that um, can require kind of ex quite extensive altering of the program in many different areas using the the previous um, design. Um, and so, really, what I kind of focused on is taking this single code base and moving it from a, a single file to a, mo a more modular approach where we have, um, where we've split the key components of the system, the display, um, the sensors, the alarms, the power system, et cetera, into separate components that inter um, the interface with the sort of main control loop via kind of common interfaces. And the benefit of this is that it essentially abstracts away the specific hardware implementations so that should the need arise to, to make changes to the, the components used, these can be swapped out fairly simply without requiring extensive redevelopment of the code. You could simply, you know, you, you just need to essentially write a driver for the new, for the new device you're, you're putting in, for the new sensor, the new display, um, make any changes you need to the logic as necessary. But it, it can drastically kind of improve the kind of, or decrease the speed at which you can, or in, increase the speed rather, um, that you can make these changes. Um, there's further work that we that we need to kind of do on the software side, such as kind of integrating the some of the improved systems that um, uh, Stephanie and Sophie and Doogie have, um, have, have described, um, and also kind of ensure that there's a kind of rigorous t testing framework there, so that um, so that further development can be can be done um, with ease. Um, and there's also some other areas we could add to, such as kind of breath detection, um, different mode selections, and kind of software-based kind of filtering of of, of the pressure signals. Um, and so, to summarize um, what the, the tech team's done, essentially, um, we focused on improving four key areas of the ventilator design. Um, a more rigorously designed power supply that's capable of seamlessly switching between mains and battery power. We've uh, introduced an improved um, controller-independent alarm system. Some recommendations for improvements of the sensor components of the system, particularly around the pressure sensors, and a new software architecture that's more suitable um, for a modular design. So we'll hand over to you. All right, so I'm sure you've seen that the tech and documentations team have done a really good job in moving OFC forward. But to um, bring it even further to a TRL stage nine, or a technology ready list level uh, nine, which means that it's pretty much ready for market, this will require even further development, which as you can see here, will realistically take several years. So in addition to technical development, obviously we'll also need to uh, establish partnerships um, in, in uh, looking at the regulatory side. So um, the regulatory side can get quite complicated, so it's usually recommended to engage with a consultant to help 
make sure that um, all the documentation is ready, all the um, paperwork is filed, and of course for operations as well. So we need to be able to make sure that we can manufacture this device uh, in an economical way. Um, so we could look at contract manufacturers or local manufacturing of the device. And we could also look at um, partnering with local distributors who are knowledgeable about the local healthcare infrastructures of our target countries, and also establishing like um, an infrastructure for after-sale support. So another activity, of course, will be local partnerships, which I will talk about a little later. And of course, we also have another elephant in the room, which is, of course, funding. So. Um, uh, optimistically and realistically, um, obviously we'll at least need around maybe 2 million USD for further development and a little bit of additional funding for Operation Startup and hopefully if this uh, venture is, success is successful, it could be self-sustaining. So um, we also looked at um, like possible ways in which we could um, uh, move forward with this, at least in the financial uh, way. So we considered um, several financing scenarios because we need... Um, additional funding for the R&D because we're still relatively at an early stage, so we need to really push that forward. And we also need additional funding for the startup year. So we considered several financing scenarios. So um, first scenario is where we try to get everything done through grants or uh, donations. So of course the expected return for this is mostly social impact, capacity development, or even like collaborations. So we also considered several scenarios where we approach uh, maybe private investors for a social enterprise. So, of course, there will be financial um, returns that are expected, as well as social impact, especially if we start approaching, for example, impact investors. So, um, we did some very preliminary financial analysis of this, just to see how, how if this is actually something that's uh, financially um, sustainable, and um, in some cases, it can be sustainable, but um, it's important to note, and I think we could also um, gauge this intuitively, is that, of course, once we um, rely less on um, grants or donations, there's going to be a higher risk for these private investors. So it's really um, an aim for obviously um, should really be to seek um, as much uh, like grants or whatever um, donations or grants that we could get in order to move this forward, especially to achieve that uh, key regulatory, regu regulatory milestone, which um, there's a still a lot of uncertainty on whether we could actually achieve that. So, um, of course, all of this is also dependent on uh, other certainties, such as the market size that we could actually capture. Can we expand this market size? Can we also actually reach that market? But there are some activities that Opsi can do in order to reach that. So, of course, this, this is, as I mentioned earlier, our local partnerships. So, of course, the first one is um, during the early R&D stage, we should always make sure that we're collaborating with our local partners to make sure that whatever we're developing is fit for purpose and actually something that they need. So, obviously, has already done this throughout its development. And once we hit the uh, clinical evaluations and testing stage, um, it'll re be really good to also engage with local partners to um, establish field demonstrations of OVSI. Um, these local partners could also serve as ch uh, champions or early adopters of the OVSI ventilator, so they could serve as really valuable use cases when we're talking to um, investors or um, even talking to uh, local gatekeepers, because as hinted earlier, one of the um, unexpected uh, challenges in really trying to um, diffuse a medical technology, especially in um, LMICs or low and middle income countries is, well, there are issues with um, who actually decides which ventilators are being purchased. Because um, we really need to engage with these people to really um, show the value of OPSI. And of course, there's also other activities that can be done, such as capacity building um, activities, such as training of um, technicians and um, clinicians. So it will also be really good to engage with our um, early adopters to develop these types of programs. So this is the end of our presentation. My team can come on stage if they want. Uh, thanks for your attention. As we mentioned, as Axel mentioned at the very start of this uh, presentation, the aim of this project is to be an open source project so that other people can build on our work and also like if not continue it as is, take some parts of it and take what works for future development. So we're going to proceed to the public release of our GitLab so that everybody can, will be able to access and modify it.
Let's have a look whether we can get this going. Um, moment of truth. Um, it should come up as a shared screen. <coughs> Give me one second. Yeah. Oh yeah, there we are. Um, I'm just on the wrong screen. <laughs> so this was on um, the GitLab website where we have uh, accumulated all the designs, all the um, uh, documentation and um, all the code. Um, and we are very pleased that we can release this design through the university under the uh, CERN Open Hardware uh, License in, in its uh, strongly reciprocal form. So everybody who's contributing to this going forward will share their, their designs back with the project. Um, and it's going to be public. Who wants to do the honors? I think we just need to click on here. Um, and I'll switch on from private to, to public. Anybody want to do that from the team? Come on. <laughs> this is exciting times. <laughs> hey. uh, <okay>. <laughs> <laughs> And so if you have any questions, we'll, we'll take them as well. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. So any, any questions to the team yeah, from the audience? No? Yes? <laughs> Hayden, you go first. Yeah. Hello? So this was just, so this was like the ventilator system and you mentioned there's a, an oxygen concentrator system as well. Do these, how did them two systems like interact together and like do you have any like input into that oxygen concentrator part? So the two teams uh, communicate quite regularly and the, the whole point of, of the, if you remember the design, I don't know if I can switch to the slides, but basically the oxygen input is then concentrated. So we could have any oxygen input in there. However, it's been identified as one of the key challenges of accessing ventilations in LMIC is the, the oxygen supply. So that's why it's a very important component of this project. Yeah, Clement, machine. Yeah. So first of all, congratulations, it's great and very exciting to be part of this public uh, unveiling. Um, so pretending the PhD supervisors aren't in the room, um, are, you, are you planning to continue? Have you thought a bit about how you could stay involved? Do you want to? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We haven't actually discussed this as a team. I don't really, we'll, we'll maybe come, up, come back to you with a more concerted answer. Yeah. <laughs> I, I suggest you, you, you speak to previous cohorts. They'll have some valuable advice, depending on who you speak to. Well, <laughs> does anyone in the room want to give us their experience of continuing summer projects? Thanks. Well, first of all, congratulations. I mean, it, it's uh, fascinating what you've achieved in these ridiculously complicated circumstances. It's a wonderful uh, presentation you've given. I wanted to ask you about um, the, the part, you talked about streams that were commercial, streams that were non-commercial. Um, how is OFSI going forward on both those lines? I mean, is, is, there, is there conflicts of interest? Um, and and how, how could we, um, so how, 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 do you, how do you do the two things in parallel? I, it, are there now companies being formed uh, as part of this? 
by other fractions or groups? <laughs> or, and and how, how does this work with what you are doing and, and for the, for the non-commercial parts? Yeah. Sorry, could you like? <laughs> I don't. We we're not really aware of. I don't think we're aware of other companies that are formed so, from so out like spinning out of obviously. From, we don't from know about that. So, but you did mention there were commercial activities planned, right? I, if I got that right. Yeah. So I mean, I, I, I think so. This is probably in reference to people uh, to to some of the collaborators who worked on the project quite early on, uh, who. Um, uh, in South Africa have, have started to move uh, on uh, with the project with, with a load of commercial partners, uh, some of the conditions which seem to be that, that uh, kind of open releases of their further iterations are, are less likely and potentially might okay. be commercialised. So did, did they use the platform to develop commercial technologies? Pretty, pretty, pretty much, actually. Right. But I mean, you know, again, it's sort of, I suppose, Ultimately, you know, and this is probably more a question for, for sort of Axel really to answer. But you know, if if it, if it is a good way of getting uh, sort of context-appropriate ventilators into these low-income countries, that would be um, then you know that that is absolutely a win. And especially you know, especially if it is coming out of the early obviously platform. Um, okay. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Maybe I can comment on it a bit more. I guess um, um, the, the Team Challenge team has come into this project that's been kind of going for a while and, and come to a bit of a standstill locally um, uh, before you guys engaged again on it. Um, and, and of course, the nature of the overall project was such that it's a sort of a bottom-up approach where there wasn't um, an awful lot of experience and um, uh, a team formed before the challenge hit us or we took the challenge up. Um, in South Africa, we've, we've been working with um, BFI, um, uh, a local wide good manufacturer, who've really taken the design forward. And my understanding is it's still being pursued there, albeit also slower than initially planned. Um, but like we've heard this morning um, from our colleagues at EPFL, I think there's a lot of space, and we've had discussions already since, um, where maybe teaming up together um, is in everyone's benefit and working out really how we can get this technology to market in a sustainable way is just another one of those challenges, but one that will be hopefully fascinating and, and rewarding to, to tackle. And um, from Obsi's side of uh, view, we are very, very welcome, uh, welcoming to, to exploring this with, with other, par other partners. And, and the aim really is to get the technology out there in, uh, or learn from other projects as well and, and, and group them together. Um, and this is, of course, complex, um, but will be will be fun to do. Thank you very much. Yeah, congratulations for all the sum of uh, knowledge that you've been able to gather in this process, because it's always, in the end, a learning process, and uh, one never knows exactly what what are the final stages until you get to that impact that we're all looking for. And for sure, it's not going to be one institution alone somewhere doing or uh, having that success. So I think this is a great contribution to the, to the subject. And uh, uh, as, as Axel said, I mean, this is certainly something we're going to be uh, um, thinking about working together, uh, I hope. And, uh, and uh, in the end, uh, what we need is these devices to be operational and really used in the context and we're all striving for that so congratulations and thank you very much for this great work thanks thank you yes uh, i also at least definitely want to uh, add um, as well that, that word of congratulations to all your efforts because i actually learned quite a bit from listening some to, to some of the aspects that you, you know uh, that you you actually shared with us here what I wanted to uh, say and add uh, as well is that there was actually uh, uh, one initiative that might be of interest to you that might, uh, you know, before you all disperse and go, you know, go further away from um, also from South Africa. But I don't believe it was related to the DeFi. This was uh, led by the, uh, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, the CSIR, and uh, they were using um, techniques that involve digital twins, et cetera, to try and really uh, produce something apparently that I believe was able to be launched uh, uh, for a ventilator. So 
I will share that uh, information so that I think it could reinforce some of the uh, questions, open questions that I saw you uh, bring up during the, uh, your, your speech there. Yeah, Ben and um, then Pietro, maybe. Yeah, thanks. Hello. Uh, fantastic work. Uh, just to echo everybody else, you guys have done so much in the last uh, year, so that's really impressive. Um, I wonder what you think of the compatibility of this open source model with a commercial model going forward, like four or five years. I imagine this is something you probably all think thought about, especially if you were to take on private money. I can think of a few medical device companies who started with this open source model, but then down the line, external forces have made them kind of shut that down a little bit. I mean, I, I, I don't really have much to say because obviously, you know, our involvement, I don't know how long we will sort of continue. But I mean, it's interesting because I know a lot of, there were a lot of ventilator companies, sort of manufacturers, who, do, who made them commercially, who released their designs uh, effect, effectively sort of so that, that it could be manufactured right at the beginning, beginning of the pandemic. I mean, there's a whole sort of world that, that sort of exists in kind of open source and how you kind of do that alongside kind of commercialized stuff. But I mean, there have been loads of projects that have been very successfully open source and sort of have been wild, wild success commercially. I mean, yeah, well, right at the top, you've got Spire Dreenets and things like that. This is not, I think, sort of a, it's quite a high platform to aim for. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I would imagine that uh, this is more of a sort of basis for sort of starting off kind of commercial projects, maybe, or or sort of iterating on design. And that's part of the reason it's been released sort of to, to the public so other people can work on it. Yeah. I just wanted to add very quickly that it's important um, to mention that um, even if it goes to more commercial applications, the whole idea, not only of like open source, but um, the whole idea of inclusive innovation and um, social appropriateness um, should be um, conserved. So the whole idea is that um, no matter how the offset project goes forward, um, the values are preserved. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to say I am pro open source. That's <laughs> just interesting, I think, as a, as a consideration. Yeah. Pietro, and then maybe Dika. Yeah. Or the other way around. I, I think um, that question's just raised a, a very interesting debate that we might have at some point on uh, where the boundary is for open source. Uh, I too am very pro open source, but in the diagnostics field, I've encountered a barrier now to the next step where uh, I, an IP portfolio becomes an important criteria to commercialization. Uh, and I, I think the majority of people in this room would be very pro open source, and indeed, we, we promoted that. Uh, and so I think it's interesting to see that for commercialization, it, it can be an inhibition to uh, people who really want to be commercial to take up the technology. Uh, and it's probably something that we need to take on board in our thinking and not be afraid of that point when perhaps we have to protect the IP. But the, where that boundary is, is really fuzzy. And, uh, and hopefully we can continue to do most of what we do as open source uh, and learn to find where that boundary is to saying, okay, this is the point where we've got to protect the IP. And even if we're giving very low cost licenses we have some control, uh, or we can give that control so that it can be commercialized. Yeah, that's a really yeah. good comment, Lisa. Um, and I think it's also something that we've um, encountered a bit, and so for the concentrator, we're not entirely sure what the best model is. So we've tried this out, we all come to this quite naively, and, and we're learning. But yeah, let's, let's see, yeah, but Pietro? Yeah. Hi, uh, really nice work. It's fascinating to see you jump into this uh, project. 
And I seem to remember in 2020, at some point, um, the, the team uh, got hold of uh, one of the sort of artificial lungs, and uh, there was probably only one in the UK as a sort of device to validate what, what they'd done up to then. And so what you presented today, it, it looks like you could do certainly certain things like on, on, the, on the battery and power supply, certainly without the lung. But he also talked about uh, moving the valves to different places uh, along the, the ducting. So, so I have a two-part question. One is, uh, would you get the lung back at some point? And the second question is, is the sort of artificial lung simple enough that you could think of perhaps a future project in which you sort of build those? Because once your device or the OPSI sort of ends up in uh, lots of um, lower middle income countries, they might not have the, the lung to assess whether it's working okay and generally whether ventilators work okay. So would that be sort of an interesting instrument? I mean, yeah, calibration is, is, of course, one of the main, like calibration and checking that something is safe is one of the main issues of getting something safely to market. So, like, if we could get a hold of one such artificial lung, that would be a great thing. I don't know if we're thinking of developing one of our own. I think it's a whole different set of other regulations and issues that we are not really ready to dive into yet. But in the mechanical design, it's like one of the reasons why we decided to focus on the electronics is also because the mechanical design had been, well, designed by people who, whose focus it was to do mechanical design, and we had more like skill sets more towards electronics. And also, we had access to a version of the device that was not completely airtight, for example, which made it quite hard to measure, actually, the pressure inside um, in an accurate way. So probably like some few iterations on the design itself might be necessary before we use that artificial lung. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it's working. Okay. Yeah, so just uh, coming back to this uh, this question of uh, open source versus non-open source, we can maybe comment a little bit on, from our perspective because of course it would be a very attractive model uh, what we are seeing is that in many cases, from the very moment when you want to go commercial, you will want to involve investors. And uh, if, you, if you have a model which is out there for everyone to take, that will sound like a high-risk uh, uh, investment for someone. So I think that's where the, the difficulty is with open source today. And if you're thinking about impact investors taking that spot, I'm afraid that's not going to happen because impact investors for today are mainly focusing on uh, late stage, uh, already proven uh, uh, enterprises. So there's still a gap there. And the way we do it is uh, we actually file a patent because what you own, you can give. If you don't own something, you cannot give it or you cannot control it's the way you give it. And so in our X-ray example this morning, what we did is we found patents, but we made it available to the startup company under the condition that the startup company would deploy in the regions where it was intended for. And uh, we gave it without any royalties, uh, you know, any uh, royalty condition. Uh, so I think this is, this is a complicated debate, and I would be very interested uh, in, in reading any uh, case studies of successful open source hardware devices for low and middle income countries. If you ask me to cite one, I don't have one that I could mention, in particular one that could be scaled. So I'd love to hear more about that if there's any information around, uh, I'd be very interested. If I can also add on to the like commercialization, making a profit from open source debate, there are a wide variety of ways in which we could generate profits if not for the design itself, but also all the training and the repair services and like manufacturing locally, all like there are a, a wide variety of ways in which someone could take something open source and make it profitable in a specific setting. So like the, the debate doesn't just stop at the technology level. Yeah, but, but just a, a brief comment since I have the mic right next to me. <laughs> uh, I mean, just uh, again, uh, I think one of you mentioned that uh, you, you know, you, you don't care, etc. as long as uh, this is uh, being used in a socially equitable, etc. But how are you going to police that? What if somebody comes in and poaches this and does and 
triples the, you know, and use it inappropriately, what leverage do you have if you don't have intellectual property, for example? Not that intellectual property is the entire solution, but uh, it, it's at least one of the mo most, uh, you know, how can I say, uh, um, the most accessible tools that you can use as an early stage you know, uh, innovator. So that's just, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I guess there are lots, lots of interesting points to explore. Um, more, many more of them we can do in the tea break, um, and then in years to come, I think there'll be plenty of it. But for now, uh, thanks to the entire team um, uh, for this. Thank you.